you're all as excited as I am to welcome Father Jim Martin, uh, SJ, and hear him speak on Jesus, face of the Father's mercy. So Father Jim is a Jesuit priest, editor-at-large of America Magazine, and author of many books, including the New York Times bestsellers, Jesus, A Pilgrimage, and The Jesuit Guide to Almost Everything. A frequent commentator on religion in the media, Father Martin has appeared on all the major television and radio networks, and has also written for a variety of publications, including the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. For several years, he was also the official chaplain to the Colbert Report. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming <clears throat> Father Jim. <clears throat> Thank you so much. <clears throat> Please, <laughs> a little dance. Thank you, Shannon. Thank you so much. Uh, can you all hear me in the back? You know the story about the priest that goes up to the microphone and blows in it like that, taps on it, and says, I think there's something wrong with this thing, and the crowd said, and also with you. <laughs> so I am very happy to be here um, at Krakow in the capital. Um, I know that uh, I am not Pope Francis, uh, and this is not World Youth Day, um, but I am a Jesuit, and there's a lot of young people here, so, you know, two out of three isn't bad. <laughs> so... You know, um, uh, I was just talking to someone on the way over that uh, so much, I'm going to take my watch off, I have a four hour speech and I don't want to go over. Um, so much of what we think about when we think about World Youth Day, um, you know, our great figures like uh, St. John Paul II, who by the way, if you haven't seen that wonderful shrine, is spectacular. Um, Pope Francis, right? Uh, but you know, both of those men uh, would tell us that World Youth Day is really about someone else. It's not about St. John Paul. Uh, it's not about Pope Francis. It's certainly not about me. Uh, it's about Jesus, right? It's about Jesus. And so today I'd like to talk a little bit about Jesus, uh, the face of mercy of the Father. To understand Jesus' approach to uh, human beings, to one another, to mercy, and for us to meet him in his mercy and for us to encounter his mercy, I think we need to encounter the real Jesus, and that's who I want to talk about today. So I want to talk, uh, start with a story that spans several decades, and it shows why it sometimes takes a long time for people, including me, to understand the Gospels. I also want to thank our sign language interpreter as well, so thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry that I can't sign. Uh, lo siento que no puedo hablar en español. <laughs> so this is a story uh, that happened to me. The first chapter happened when I was a Jesuit novice, about almost 30 years ago, before many of you were born. During the first month in the Jesuit novitiate, I read a book that talked about a place that called the Bay, the, the place called the Bay of Parables, the Bay of Parables. While I can't remember what book this was, I remember the vivid impression that it made on me. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus finds himself so hemmed in by the crowds that he climbs aboard a boat and asks Peter to row out into the Sea of Galilee, which that's the Sea of Galilee, so that he can preach from the shore. The Gospels of Mark and Matthew also report incidents of Jesus preaching from the boat. In Galilee, said this book, there's still a place known as the Bay of Parables where that gospel passage most likely happened. Near the shoreline is, and now it's a great, great to be in here, a naturally occurring amphitheater. So we're in an amphitheater here. Near the shoreline in Galilee is a naturally occurring amphitheater where people would have been able to sit comfortably and listen to Jesus, not air conditioned, but comfortably enough. Moreover, the acoustics of the site Right? So if I stood in the middle of the stage, you'd be able to hear me since this is an amphitheater. Made it easier for the crowd to hear Jesus. The idea that people could identify exactly where a particular scripture story happened really captivated me. I remember thinking, to use some theological language, that is so cool. <laughs> I hope that's not over your head at all. This is catechesis after all. But the explanation really baffled me. Why would Jesus get into a boat to address a crowd, right? Why wouldn't he just stand on the shoreline, huh? And, and talk to the people. Because of its oddness, 
the tale of the Bay of Parables really stuck with me. Second chapter of my story. A few years later, I was on a summer vacation in a Jesuit house outside of Boston in a town called Cohasset uh, on, a, on, on a bay that empties out into the Atlantic Ocean. So one morning, a few Jesuits and I were sitting on the lawn that overlooks the harbor, or the Haba, as they would say in Boston. <laughs> and we heard a commotion from the Haba, which turned out to be the ruckus from a little sailing school. If you do know what sunfish are, you know those little boats, sunfish, I don't sail, but like little, little boats. And the distance between us on the lawn and the bay, where the boats were, was about a mile. But to my surprise, I could hear the kids talking as if they were only 10 feet away. It was the darndest thing. You could hear them like, I don't know how to fix this. I don't know, I don't know how to fix my rudder. I don't know, the wind's too much. You really like, and then you could hear the teacher, no, no, don't touch that. I remarked how easy it was to one of my Jesuit brothers uh, that we could hear their voices so clearly. And one Jesuit said, of course, there's always a Jesuit that knows everything, um, <laughs> which is very convenient when you live in community. Uh, and he says, well, of course, sound travels very easily over water. And he started to talk about convection and the way that sound waves worked, right? And he said to me, do you remember the story about Jesus preaching from the boat? That's one reason he did it that way, because sound travels over water. It was easier for the crowds to hear Jesus. That casual insight totally delighted me. It reminded me that sometimes that what we might not get in the Gospels often turns out to have a real life explanation. Once we think about the historical context of the story. Finally, a third chapter. About five years ago, I took a pilgrimage to the Holy Land as part of research for a book I wrote called Jesus a Pilgrimage, which makes the perfect gift for your friends and family. <laughs> and for all of you catechists out there, it would really be a great addition to your catechetical library. Anyway, I was there for about uh, two weeks, mainly in Galilee, which is up north, and Jerusalem down south, with a Jesuit friend of mine named George. Anyway, George and I arrive in Jerusalem about 10 years after my encounter with the noisy sailing school in Cohasset. At dinner on the first night, the superior of the Jesuit community in Jerusalem, who was a Vietnamese Jesuit named Father Duan, asks us what we would most like to visit. So you know, I've been waiting like 25 years. And I say, the Bay of Parables. And Father Duan says, the what? And I say, you know, by the way, he's a scripture scholar who lives in the Holy Land. <laughs> and I say, you know, naturally occurring amphitheater on the Sea of Galilee. It's like I've never heard of it. <laughs> and I thought, well, all right, you know, so maybe it's the one place he hasn't heard of, right? I guess he's not so smart after all, right? <laughs> so a few days later, George and I make the four hour drive uh, to the Sea of Galilee and find our way to a Franciscan guest house located right on the Mount of Beatitudes, called the Mount of Beatitudes Guest House. <laughs> Very cleverly named Guest House. Uh, after we settle ourselves in the room, the Franci or our rooms, the Franciscan sister who runs the place, her name was Sister, I always have to pause, Sister Telesphora, and for the interpreter it's T-E-L-E-S-F-O-R-A. Sister Telesphora. George kept calling her Sister Teleflora. <laughs> Sister 1-800-Teleflora. So she says to us, now by the way, she's a scripture scholar who lives there on the Sea of Galilee. And she said, so Father, what would you most like to see? And I say, the Bay of Parables. And she said, the what? <laughs> so I described it to her, naturally occurring amphitheater. People could hear Jesus. She said, I've never heard of that. So afterwards, George rolled his eyes and said, it's like you were talking about Santa's workshop in the North Pole. <laughs> so a few hours later, we make our way to a place called Tabga, which is the traditional site of the miracle of the loaves and the fishes. And we pray in a little chapel there run, run by the Benedictines. And afterwards, I noticed the Benedictine monk, who's, I've, you've seen a couple of them here, uh, who's dressed in his long black habit, 
And I say to George, I'm going to ask that guy about the Bay of Parables. And he says, if you ask that guy about the Bay of Parables, I'm leaving. <laughs> so I go over. I know five words of German. So I put them all together. And I say, Guten Tag. <laughs> Wo ist die Bay of Parables? <laughs> and I was really, I was so sad. You know, you're sort of like anticipatory sadness. Because I know he's going to say I've never heard when he goes, Yeah, yeah, the Bay of Parables. <laughs> I know it. It is very close to here. <laughs> and so I called George over, who, believe it or not, speaks fluent German. <laughs> no, I'm, this is not made up. This is, you know. So I said to George, who's like looking at cards like this, like, you know, like, <laughs> like that, hiding himself. And I said, George, come over here. So George comes over, and I said, this guy knows of the bear parables. Yeah, the bear parables. <laughs> so he talks to George in German, blah, 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 blah. And George translates. He said, it's very close. Yeah, it's very close. And then he, then he talks again, blah, blah, blah. And George says, we, he says to walk down the road about a mile and cut through the bushes. Yeah, the bushes. You cut through the bushes. And then he talks again, and George looks at him, and he looks at me, and he looks at him, and George says, excuse me? I think he said, we look for rocks painted violet. And the guy goes, yeah, yeah, the rocks are painted violet. <laughs> so he said, all right. So under the blistering hot sun, it must have been about 110 degrees, uh, George followed this little map that he draws, and sure enough, we go through the bush and we almost trip over these huge boulders spray painted purple that's, that's like a path. And George goes, oh, violet colored rocks. We walk a little bit, immediately the ground drops from, away from us and we find ourselves on the rim of a naturally occurring amphitheater. People had likely stood here and listened to Jesus preach from the boat. Or as they often say in the Holy Land, if it didn't happen here, it happened 100 yards from here. It's very small. I was just telling someone on the way over, we sometimes think about towns like Capernaum, Bethsaida, Magdala. You know, we read about those and we think, oh, it must be, I did. It must be like Boston, New York, Washington. No, 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 no. It's more like Capitol Hill, Brookland. I mean, they're very close. They're like neighborhoods almost. So Jesus would have stood around here. As I gazed on that beautiful water, I could imagine people listening to Jesus preach from the boat. And George said, We have found the Bay of Parables. <laughs> then I saw something that amazed me even more. All around us was this, rocky ground, fertile ground, and thorn bushes. Does that sound familiar? Yeah. In the parable of the sower, as you know, Jesus tells the story of the farmer who goes out to sow and his seed falls on those different kinds of grounds, right? As I stood under the broiling sun, I was amazed to see rocks and big thorn bushes and fertile ground. No one had planted the thorn bushes, right? Or carted in topsoil or arranged the rocks to make it look like it did in Jesus' time as if we were in a theme park called Jesus Land, right? They were just there. And it dawned on me that when Jesus used objects from nature to convey his message, seeds, birds, rocks, clouds, water, he wasn't talking in generalities, but about these things right here. Not those people are like thorn bushes in general, but people like that are like that thorn bush. Not people who hear the word of God and accept it are like good soil, but they're like that soil right there. Not people who can't hear the word of God are like a rock, but they're like those rocks that you're standing on right there. It grounded the Gospels and it grounded Jesus in a way that I could have never imagined. It reminded me once again that Jesus, the face of mercy, right? The Son of God, the fully divine Son of God, is fully human and fully divine. And to encounter him, we have to encounter the fully human, fully divine one. Now, what does that mean? Let's unpack that a little bit fully human. To begin with, Jesus of Nazareth, the person who walked the landscape of first century Palestine, was not God pretending to be human. He was a flesh and blood, real life, 
excuse the expression, honest to God person who experienced everything that human beings do. Jesus was born and lived and died, right? The child who was called Yeshua, which would have been his name in Aramaic, entered the world as helpless as any newborn and just as dependent on his parents as any of us were. He needed to be nursed, held, fed, burped, and changed. Although I don't want to think about what diapers were like in first century Nazareth, probably made from wood. As a boy growing up in the tiny town of Nazareth, he skinned his knees on rocky ground, he's pricked his fingers on thorns, he bumped his head on doorways. He watched the sun rise and set over the countryside. He wondered how far away the moon was. Jesus had a body, like yours and mine, which meant he ate, he drank, he slept, he experienced sexual longings and urges. How do we know that? He's fully human. We know he was celibate, but he must have had sexual longings and urges. He felt joy and sadness. He laughs, right? He told clever stories. How do we know he laughs? He's fully human. What kind of a person is who doesn't laugh? He had joy. He talks about joy all the time in the Gospels. He cries. We know that. He cries at the death of his friend Lazarus. He pulled muscles. He felt sick to his stomach. He got cold sores. He got headaches. You know, he got stomach aches. A couple years ago, uh, a norovirus went through our community. Uh, you know what a norovirus is, right? Um, so it's really, it's like this kind of severe, terrible, awful, I won't describe it. Um, so, uh, it, you know, when you're in a religious community, if one person gets sick, everyone's going to get sick. You can use all the Purell that you want, but it's not going to help. So one night as I was hunched over the toilet for the fifth time, I had a thought. This is what Jesuits think when they're throwing up. Um, you know what I thought? I thought Jesus did this. I love saying that because people sort of freak out. Jesus threw up. Oh, that sounds terrible. No, it doesn't. He's human. He had a human body. He got sick from time to time. Everything proper to the human being except sin, Jesus experienced. Now, Jesus' humanity is a stumbling block for many people, maybe even some people here in this audience. Gospel stories that show Jesus displaying intense emotions can unsettle people who prefer to focus just on the divine one. At one point in the Gospel of Mark, a woman comes to Jesus, the famous Syrophoenician woman or the Canaanite woman, and she asks Jesus to heal her daughter. Now, Mark's Gospel is very kind of blunt and earthy and direct. The woman is not Jewish, and as a result, Jesus seems to dismiss her by saying, this is a quote, this is Jesus, it is not fair to take children's food and throw it to the dogs, end quote. Now, scripture scholars say that that would have been as shocking as it would be today. Imagine you came up to me at one of the, at afterwards and you said, Father, you know, I really liked your talk. I'd love if you come to my parish you know, in Arlington or Alexandria or Chevy Chase. And I say, oh, I'm sorry, I don't speak to dogs. <laughs> oh my gosh. That is just, that, that word would have been just as harsh back then. But the woman responds, as you know, even the dogs get the crumbs from the table. And Jesus says, for saying that, you may go, the demon has left your daughter, right? Why is Jesus speaking like that? It's a, that's a very mysterious question. Was it because he was visiting what Mark called the region of Tyre, a non-Jewish area, and presumably wasn't expected to do miracles? If so, why doesn't he respond more gently? Was he testing her faith? That's what you will normally hear in a homily. He's testing her. There are other ways to test faith. Why that way? Well, maybe Jesus needed to learn something from the woman's persistence that his ministry extends to everyone, not just to the Jewish people. Or maybe he was just tired. A few lines earlier in the Gospel of Mark, it says he entered a house and did not want anyone to know he was there. Perhaps that remark indicates just a little weariness, right? Whatever the case, and we'll never know for sure when we get to heaven and can ask Jesus all these questions. I have a lot of questions for Jesus too. <laughs> I believe that story shows his humanity at the very least, he's learning something from her. She challenges, he softens, or at least changes his approach, 
heals their daughter. And that's a key. There's another part of the story, a healing. She returns home, says Mark, and finds her child lying on the bed, quote, the demon gone. Fully human and fully divine means that Jesus of Nazareth wasn't just a great guy, an inspiring teacher, a holy man. He was God. He was God. We have to remind ourselves of that. He does astonishing deeds, which the gospel writers call either works of power in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, or signs in John's gospel. Today we call them miracles, healing the sick, calming storms, raising people from the dead. Time and again, the gospels report that Jesus' followers, no matter how long they've been with him, are amazed or astonished by what they do. I always like the story of the healing of the paralyzed man in Mark. And the disciples say, we have never seen anything like this. And I want to say, yeah, no kidding. <laughs> Even his detractors take note of the miracles. If you think about it, the miracles, that he does miracles is never in question in the Gospels. No, even his detractors say that he does miracles. The detractors say, where do you get this power and why are you healing on the Sabbath, right? So even his opponents granted that he did miracles. The miracles are an essential part of the story of Jesus as are other signs of his divinity. So is the resurrection. If Jesus' his humanity is a stumbling block for many, his divinity in our culture is even more so. So Pope Francis and St. John Paul and Pope Benedict have all told us to evangelize the culture, right? This is the part of the story that culture, not everybody, but many people find difficult. For a rational modern mind, talk of the supernatural can be disturbing. I'm sure you know people like this. Many people admire Jesus, Oh, I really like Jesus, you know, I like the Beatitudes, I like what he teaches about the poor. But they stop short of believing him to be divine. Despite the proportion of the Gospels that focus on his works of power, many people want to confine his identity to that of a wise teacher. They want to put him in a little box, right? Thomas Jefferson, you may know, went so far as to create his own Gospel. Did you know this? He actually cut out the parts of the story that he didn't like. You know, so the miracles, the resurrection. Like many of us, he felt uncomfortable with parts of Jesus' story. He wanted a Jesus who didn't threaten or discomfort him. He wanted a Jesus he could tame. But you can't tame Jesus, right? Both humanity and divinity are parts of Jesus' story. Omit one or the other. Scissor out the uncomfortable parts. And it's not Jesus we're talking about, it's our own creation. Now much of this division between people who want just a human Jesus and people who want just a divine Jesus can be seen through two types of approaches today. People who prefer the Jesus of history and people who prefer the Christ of faith. So very briefly, this is the catechetical part. In historical Jesus studies, Scholars of the Jesus of history, I'm putting that in quotes not to make fun of it because that's, that's the term, Jesus of history. Try to explain as much as we can know about the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth. So they focus on topics like Jewish customs in first century Palestine, the reality of life under Roman rule, right? In Galilee, the way a carpenter would have sustained himself. Such research helps us better understand Jesus in the context of his times. So for a great example I always like to use, we've all, uh, you all know the, story, the, the parable of the talents. Remember the parable of the talents, right? Uh, master goes away, he gives one servant five, another servant two, another servant one. Remember that parable? Right. So we all say, most Americans say, or Westerners say, well, that's nice, you know, talent, probably like a quarter. A talent was the equivalent of 20 years of wages, right? So you give someone five talents, that's giving someone 100 years of wages. That's a huge amount. So just that little piece of information helps us understand the parable better, what Jesus is trying to get at, and Jesus better. That's the idea behind historical Jesus studies. Scholars use every tool available, our understanding of first century cultures, our knowledge of the local languages, especially archeological finds in the region, to understand Jesus' life and times. Such studies are closely aligned with what's called a Christology from below, right? Starting with Jesus as the human being. 
the Jesus of history, really important stuff. But there are just as many scholars who focus less on the details of his time on earth and more about his place in the Christian faith. These people consider topics like the resurrection, how Christ saves us, the nature of his relation to the Father and the Spirit. They focus on what's called the Christ of faith, and it's called a Christology from above. They focus on the divinity of Christ. Here the starting point is Jesus, the Son of God. The difference between these two approaches can be shown with a brief example, which I love to talk about. The story of Lazarus. So we all know the story of Lazarus. Midway in the Gospel of John, the, uh, the brother of uh, Jesus' friends, Mary and Martha, dies in Bethany. Okay, so point one, Bethany. Well, there's a real Bethany. It's right outside of Jerusalem. And guess what it's called? You know what's interesting? In, in Arabic, you know what the Arabic name of that town is now? El Azariah, place of Lazarus. Isn't that cool? That's what it's called. It's not called Bethany, it's El Azaria. So there is a Bethany. Now, John says, G now Jesus loved Mary and Martha and their brother. Boom. So there's a little insight into his humanity. He had friends. He didn't have just apostles and disciples. He had friends. He loved them. Mary and Martha tell Jesus their brother is sick. And you know what they say, which I love. They don't say, what do you say? Lazarus of Bethany is ill. Lazarus, our brother, is ill. Lazarus, your disciple, is ill. Do you know what they say in the Greek? So you know the, the Gospels were written in Greek. The Greek is hon phileis, H-O-N-P-H-I-L-E-I-S. Hon phileis, he whom you love. Isn't that great? He whom you love is ill. Oh my gosh, what an insight into Jesus' ability to have intimate friendships. He whom you love is ill. His humanity. He gets the message, he waits a few days. Why? It's very mysterious. The disciples don't know why he's waiting. Finally, he goes to Bethany. Mary and Martha come out. You know the story. And what does Mary, what do Mary and Martha say? Now, if, sometimes if you hear it preached, you hear them say, this is just the other day too, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. <laughs> okay, that might be one possibility. Let's, let's, let's do a thought experiment. Your mother is sick, she's having a heart attack. Your friend is the chief cardiologist at Georgetown Medical Center. So you call the chief cardiologist of Georgetown Medical Center and you say, my mother's having a heart attack. He says, okay, I'll be right over. He doesn't come, she dies. He comes at the funeral. Are you gonna say, oh, hello, if you had been here, my mother would not have died. No, you're gonna say, if you had been here, my mother would not have died. Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. Mary and Martha are real people. These are not fictional characters. They are real strong people, women, who come into Jesus' life and express strong emotions. They love him enough to be able to be honest with him. He says, show me, show me where you've lain him. And should they say, come and see. He weeps, you know, which harkens back to what he says in the beginning of the Gospel of John, to the disciples, come and see. He goes to the tomb and he weeps. And then he says, move away the stone, right? And then he stands in front of the tomb and he says in a British accent, because we've all seen the movies, right? <laughs> Lazarus, come forth. <laughs> you know, and there's an orchestra too. Because <laughs> um, he traveled with a band. He traveled with a band. <laughs> the, the man comes out and Jesus says, untie him and let him go. Great image. They don't know what to do with him. Right? Jesus has to kind of even minister to the people there. What's the point? The point is that people, people who are looking at the historical Jesus studies would ask the following questions. Why did he wait? Was there a significance to the fact that he's waiting? Is there something about the culture that makes him wait? And the answer is yes. And you can read about it in Jesus a Pilgrimage, my book. <laughs> are there stones like that? You know, we read the stories. It makes, you know, there's a stone that's rolled away. Yes, there are. How do we know? Archaeology. Historical Jesus studies remind us 
of the historical context and help explain the story. Someone looking at it from the point of a Christology from above, right, from the Christ of faith, would say, how does the story of Lazarus tell us about Jesus' ability to give life, right? What does it say about Jesus' own resurrection, right? A spirituality book would say something like, where are we called to be called out of our tombs, right? So there's just different ways of looking at the same person in the same story. Both sets of questions are important. And if we lose sight of either perspective, we risk turning Jesus into either God pretending to be man or a man pretending to be God. So books that look at just one or the other, right, are not complete. Historical Jesus books are terrific and fascinating and really important. And sometimes people dismiss them because they say, well, we don't want to look at mere historical things. Well, you want to know, you know, what's the context of, of this man's life, right? But just as often, you get to historical books who say, well, when we get to the parts about the miracles and the resurrection, we're not going to look at that because that's sort of faith and we don't look at that. Well, that's incomplete. To encounter Jesus, right, to understand his message of mercy, to understand all of his messages, we have to meet both the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, right? So that's, that's one way to encounter him. Moreover, Jesus is always fully human and fully divine. That is, he's not just divine in one episode and human in another. It's not like after he does, stills the storm, he says, oh, I'm so tired of being divine. I think I'll just be human for a day, you know? <laughs> or, you know, he goes to Lazarus, it's like, time to be divine again, you know? Like a secret identity. <laughs> I always like to tell audiences this. When Jesus is raising Lazarus, he's fully human. When he's sawing wood in the carpentry workshop at Nazareth, he's fully divine. Isn't that something? He's fully human and fully divine at all times. Now, there's some things about Jesus we can't know, but historical Jesus studies really helps us to understand both the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith. And I want to end with one brief, before we do a little questions and answers, one brief um, comparison between two towns. The first, and I love talking about this, the first town is Nazareth. And I want you to look around a bit, um, get a sense, how many people do you think are in this audience? Probably about 250, 300, right? Is that about right? Would you agree with me? Yeah. Okay. Look around, especially people in the front. Look around and get a sense of how big this audience is. Just get a sense, okay? Get a sense of what 250 to 300 people look like. Um, see if this moves. Um, Welcome to Nazareth. 200 to 400 people. This is how big Nazareth is. This is Nazareth. Nazareth was tiny. It was a joke. Remember when in the Gospel of John they say, we have found the Messiah, he is Jesus of Nazareth. And Nathaniel says, what does Nathaniel say? Can anything good come from Nazareth? So that's a diss. That's like saying, can anything good come from Arlington? <laughs> oh. <laughs> now, why do you laugh? You laugh because you haven't heard that. We, we, we've, we, we've sort of, we've heard that, that saying so many times, it's like nothing. It's a joke. John, the Gospel of John has preserved a joke. Seriously, that is, it. That is can anything good come from Nazareth? Is like, can anything good come from fill in the blank? But we hear that in, 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 in Mass and we say, what do we say when we hear that story and preached in the Gospel or proclaimed in the Gospel? We don't laugh, we say, praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> but it's a joke. It's a sign of how insignificant Nazareth was at the time. There are 50 to 60 towns in Galilee, which is, you know, the, the a northern region in Israel now, mentioned in the Talmud in the Old Testament. So you think about it. Just, all, just think about all the towns that are mentioned. When we were traveling in, in, in pilgrimage, we got lost, my friend and I, and he said, where are we? And I opened up my map and I said, we're in Shiloh. He was like, oh, come on. I was like, no, look, we're in Shiloh. Where do we have to go? We have to go to Gilead. He was like, come on. I said, no, look, the, the, there's Bible names all over the place, you know? <laughs> Nazareth is not in any of the writings in the Old Testament. 
Nazareth was tiny. It was poor. It was a joke. It's a joke town. What did Jesus do in Nazareth? He was in the Greek, I love this word, a tekton, T-E-K-T-O-N, tekton. We normally translate it as carpenter, also woodworker, craftsman, construction worker. These are different translations. Day laborer, right? He would have had to make tables and benches, and maybe even plows, they say. They say that when Jesus says, my yoke is easy, he may have been referring to something that he made. And people might have said, I remember he did make good yokes like that, right? I know, it's not supposed to be funny, but it always comes out as funny. <laughs> he probably did make good jokes, too. Tecton was seen as low class. Now, we know every vocation is holy if done freely and for God, right? But at that time, a tecton was seen as low class. Why? It did not have the benefit of a plot of land. He didn't have land. So it was more itinerant. So low class occupation from a poor town, right? A poor, insignificant joke town. An hour and a half's walk from Nazareth is a place called Sepphoris. S-E-P-P-H-O-R-I-S. Sepphoris. It was being rebuilt by King Herod at the time. It was beautiful. 30,000 people lived there. It had an amphitheater that seated 5,000 people. How do we know? Go look. It's still there. That's what's so great about historical Jesus studies and archaeology. There it is. It had beautiful houses. It had a fortress. It had banks. It's an hour and a half from Nazareth. You know in those times and in rural times, people would walk. That's easy for people to walk, right? It was being rebuilt at the time that Jesus was plying his craft as a carpenter from age 12 to 30. That's 18 years, right? He works. Scholars say that it's very likely, it's probably 99% sure, that Jesus would have at least gone to Sepphoris two or three times. He's a carpenter. He's looking for work, right? In fact, Jesus' use of that word hypocrite, remember he calls the Pharisees hypocrites? That's a word from Greek theater. Where does he get that? He's not Greek. Maybe from the Greek theater in Sepphoris, right? Now, here's the point. This is what I'm getting at. And this is in terms of his mercy. What does Jesus think, say the 20, 25-year-old carpenter, as he goes from the rich town of Sepphoris, where you can see mosaics, and frescoes in the houses. Once again, that's all archeological discovery. And he comes back to the poor town of Nazareth where he sees his mother over her backbreaking labors or his father trying to eke out a living. What is he thinking? What is he thinking when he sees the wealthy people of Sepphoris with their mosaics and their frescoes. And he comes back and he sees the poor in his poor little town that people joke about. How could his heart not be moved with pity, as the Gospels say? So here's the point where we think about Jesus' mercy. We often think that the parables and the stories and the teachings that Jesus expresses come from divine inspiration, and they do, because he's the Son of God, right? But they also flow from his human experience. He's a human being, too. He sees these things. His heart is moved with pity. So his mercy is a divine mercy, right? but it's also a human mercy, fully human and fully divine. So to meet Jesus, the face of mercy, we have to encounter the fully human one and fully divine one. It is a mystery, right? We can never fully comprehend it. There are some things that we cannot understand. In fact, in my New Testament class years ago, there was a great 
scripture scholar named Father Dan Harrington. And he knew everything about the New Testament. And one day, I just want to check my watch. One day this uh, student got up. I'm sure this never happened in any of the schools you were at, but sometimes when people ask questions, it's not to ask a question, but to show how much they know, right? I'm sure that's never happened to you. You've never seen anyone do that. But I assure you, it does happen. And so this, this guy gets up, he stands up in class, which we never did, and I thought, what is this guy standing up for? And Father Harrington just started to talk about, had talked about Jesus' miracles. And this guy goes, this kid goes, Father Harrington, let me ask you a question. With what we know about Jesus' identity as the second person of the Trinity and his relationship vis-a-vis -vis the Father and the Holy Spirit, as he is performing these signs in the Gospel of John, what is going through his mind in terms of his self-identity and his consciousness of his own divinity? And Father Harrington said, I have no idea. <laughs> But while there are some things that will always remain a mystery uh, about Jesus, there are some things that we can think about, right? And we can educate ourselves about and that we can learn through catechesis. And really, it is a mystery, but it is the most beautiful mystery I know and one well worth pondering for a lifetime. Thank you very much. So uh, we have time for a few questions, and I think the easiest thing, just shout it out, and um, we have about 15 minutes, just shout it out and I'll shout it back so people can hear it. I can, I can usually hear pretty, pretty well. So any questions about Jesus, about Jesuits, about Pope Francis, um, about anything? Catechetical, kudos, catcalls, comments, <laughs> where to buy my books, um, anything, anything about Jesus or anything that you're curious about? Ask the Jesuit. Yes. That's okay. You don't have to apologize. <laughs> I did ask for questions. Yes. Okay. So, like, we talk about how Jesus is divine and he's also human. And some of the Gospels take it out to be like, like, if, when he was challenged, he's like, oh, but Jesus knew he was going to challenge him. But in other ones, it's like, well, Jesus had to sit back and think. Like, how do you. That is a great question. So, that is a terrific question. So in some of the Gospels, it does seem, you know, like Jesus knew that he was, you know, they were, they were talking, Jesus knew what they were thinking, you know, when they're disputing. And in other Gospels, it seems like he doesn't know. That is a great question. You know, um, the Gospels do present him uh, differently. Uh, some, some, to answer that one question, someone said to me once that that he knew what they were thinking may have not been a kind of divine knowledge of, you know, interiorly about what they were thinking, but that he was a good judge of human character. You know, you see people over there going like, oh, yeah. And you know what they're thinking, so there's a little of that. But we do, I'm gonna really address your question directly. It is the question of, of Jesus's uh, knowledge, you know, and his consciousness. Now here's what theologians say. Now th this is a mystery too. For Jesus to be fully divine would mean that he would have a divine consciousness. Okay, that makes sense. Now, a divine consciousness knows everything. So Jesus says, for example, you know, uh, crucify me and I will raise up, uh, this, this body will be raised up in three days. So there are signs that he has this divine consciousness. He knows what's going to happen. He perceives things, right? For him to be fully human would mean he would need to have a human consciousness. And a human consciousness only knows as much as it's taught. So for example, in the story of Mark, the Syrophoenician woman, why, why does he need to be challenged? You know, why doesn't he know what's needed? Why does he say at one point, and only the father knows that, not the son in John, remember that? Does not know the time or the hour, you know? So the answer is it's a mystery. Some gospel passages seem to show him having full divine consciousness. Some gospel passages seem to show him having human consciousness. And the answer is, we don't know. We don't know how that works. But you will find that, and it is a mystery, you know, how those two consciousnesses work together. How did he understand himself? I think that's a beautiful question, too. Some people say he understood himself as the, the, the fully human, fully divine Son of God from the moment of his consciousness. Other people say, which I kind of like, once again, we don't know, that he grows into an understanding of who he is. 
like we all do. So if you think about it, he, you know, at the baptism, for example, he has this dramatic experience of you're God's beloved son, right? But at the wedding feast of Cana, when his mother says they have run out of wine, he says, what business is that of yours and mine? Which is great. <laughs> and she says, do whatever he tells you, which is also great. A friend of mine said that should have been said as, do whatever he tells you. <laughs> Mary seems to know his vocation earlier than he does, perhaps because she had a longer time to reflect on it. He does the miracle and it's wine, right? He seems to grow in confidence as he's doing the miracles. You know, if you choose, you're going to heal me. I do choose. Do you know? So, so my sense is that he grew in his understanding of his divinity. And then there's this, which may be wrong, you know, as I said, it's a mystery. But there's this beautiful passage from a theologian that I loved, I love. And it's that perhaps even on the cross, when he says, my God, my God, why have you abandoned me? He still you know, trying to understand, you know, sort of who he is. And that, I love this, that even on, e that on Easter Sunday, even Jesus may have been surprised. When, this is the great phrase, when his ultimate identity burst upon him in full clarity. Isn't that beautiful? I, I love that. So I like the idea that he comes gradually to understand his divinity and who he is. Certainly you do miracles and you still a storm, you figure, I'm not the average guy. <laughs> But that's a very good question you have. And, and it, it's, it's a mystery. Different authors will come down on different sides. Different, one author will say, well, he definitely knew everything. Well, no, he says, even the son does not know this. Other authors will say, no, he, could, he didn't know everything. He was human. Baloney, he says, you know, he predicts his resurrection. So it's a beautiful question. It's, it's very mysterious. Very mysterious. Maybe, yes. No, oh, yeah, so, so how to introduce people to Christ, I just want to check the time, in terms of the new evangelization and uh, without turning people off. Yes, I think that's a good goal. You know, how to really, right, especially not turning people off, right? I think, um, and I, I, know, I know Pam works in, in this kind of uh, ministry. I really think that, here, here's what I like, love to, I think the, the key thing is meeting people where they are. I really think that's so important. And I love to say, to, so, so you have someone who's like, well, I don't really believe that. Well, take them seriously. What do, you, what, do you, what do you not believe? Talk about your own experience. Remember that God has put, I mean, all of us are evangelizers and missionaries. Remember that God has put you there. Not St. John Paul II, not Pope Francis, because he's kind of busy in Krakow right now, you know. <laughs> not Mother Teresa, but you. In God's wisdom, God has put you there at the bedside of a dying person or in front of a teenager who's upset, right? Or whose mother or father has died, right? Or who's struggling with his or her sexuality, right? Or who doesn't believe in God anymore. You, you, we, it's very likely to say, it's very normal to say, what would, you know, Pope Francis say in this situation? Pope Francis has not been put there. You've been put there. Maybe for a good reason, right? So that's the first thing. Trust that you're there to meet the people where they are. And Jesus did that. What I love to think about is this. Jesus literally went to where people were. He went from Nazareth, the little crummy, poor, landlocked town, to here. Well, not here on the stage, but here in Galilee, right? He went there. He physically went there to call the disciples, right? To call uh, Peter and Andrew and James and John. And what does he say when he gets there? We get so used to the, the stories, we forget that, we forget kind of their, their radical nature. He's a carpenter. He has spent 18 years as a carpenter in Nazareth, as a tecton. That's all he knows, right? Maybe with some side trips to Sepphoris and Tiberias and a few trips to Jerusalem. When he strides up to the, to the fisherman, he does not speak as a carpenter. He does not say, now you're going to laugh, he does not say, let us sand down the rough edges of humanity. 
You're la- I know, it's funny, because we're like, well, why, why would he say that? He's a carpenter. He does not say, let us construct the foundation of the reign of God. He laughed too. We're so, but that's what he, a carpenter would say. He doesn't speak in carpentry images. What does he say? Come after me and I will make you fish for people. Isn't that beautiful? He's speaking to them as fishermen. He's speaking in their language. He's meeting them where they are. He physically goes from Nazareth to Capernaum to meet them. And then when he's there, he speaks in their language. I I think that's so beautiful. And it's funny, too. Fish for people. What? What are you talking about? You know? He, when, his, when he's using parables, he uses images from nature and everyday life. Seeds, birds, wheat, women sweeping up uh, in their house, right? A farmer going out to sow. He's not talking about, you know, now I'm going to explain the Trinity to you in soteriological terms, <laughs> right? He has to grab them, too. These were, these were farmers who were kind of busy, right? But it's great. So, so I think, and maybe this is a good place to end, if I can leave this with anything, is to meet people where they are. Speak in their language, listen to their concerns, take them seriously, and trust that God has put you there. And you can be the face of mercy, right? You can be the face of Jesus to everyone who meets you. Thank you very much. Please keep me in your prayers. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.